Did people say that? Yeah, and that's the organ that they played on. Psalm 46, verse 1 through 10. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the hearts of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. 
she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shield with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. Be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Join us in singing Tom's favorite hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Please stand. <laughs>
for a few remembrances of Tom's early life, I welcome my brother Jonathan and Tom's best friend, and oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Before we do that, our Old Testament reading has to come first, and that will be given today by Tom's good friend, Renaldo Patelio. Reading from Ecclesiastes 12, verses 1 through 7. Honor and enjoy your Creator while you're still young. Before the years take their toll and your vigor wanes. Before your vision dims and the world alerts. And the winter years keep you close to the fire. In old age, your body no longer serves you so well. Muscles slacken, grip weakens, joints stiffen. The shades are pulled down on the world. You can't go out, you can't come and go at will. Things grind to a halt. The hum of the household fades away. You are awakened now by birdsong. Hikes to the mountains are a thing of the past. Even a stroll down the road has its terrors. Your hair turns apple blossom white adorning a fragile and powerless matchstick body. Yes, you're well on your way to eternal rest, while your friends make plans for your funeral. Life, lovely while it lasts, is soon over. Life as we know it, precious and beautiful, ends. The body is put back in the same ground it came from. The spirit returns to God and first came to Tom didn't wait till the last minute. He was growing and changing and falling and rising all his life from the time his Gaga, not Lady Gaga, but his great great grandma, that's what he used to call her, told him about Jesus. To the time Dominic Mancini led him to the Lord. Through the temptations and trials of high school, getting married, losing a friend, a child. His house burning down, his young son's Jeffrey's brain tumor, and then his illness. He didn't wait to draw on God's power, and that's why we're here honoring him today. Tom wasn't perfect, and we're not here to put him on a pedestal because that belongs to Christ alone. And Tom knew that. We're here to honor the life of a man who modeled for us what it looks like to chase after God's heart. He was flawed like all of us, but he continued to fall, walk, get up, and even his battle with cancer was a metaphor for his life. Even up to last week, when the medical staff said he pulled the Lazarus in, he was forgiven, and he lived in a state of grace. Never once did I hear him complain or feel sorry for himself. He was always concerned for others and praying that God would be glorified even in his illness. And all of you here today are a testament to that legacy. For a few remembrances of Tom's early life, I welcome my brother Jonathan and Tom's best friend and best man, Gene Myers. Good afternoon. Before I begin, I just wanted to mention to you that you need to keep careful watch for your golden ticket because you will need them to be eligible to win the lottery. I can see that some of you are puzzled by the look on your faces, that you believe you don't have such a ticket. But I assure you, you do indeed have a golden ticket and it did indeed enter you into a marvelous game of chance. 
that ticket gained you admission into a life of time passion. The man who by chance touched all of our lives and filled it with love and music and faith and friendship and fellowship. As the Rogers and Hammerside song goes, let's start at the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. Tom was the firstborn of, and the firstborn son of Edwin and Myrtle Hashman. And he was the first child of Ed and Mickey's four children, and the first of making him the oldest of the seven cousins on my side of the family. With such a position comes a long list of privileges. You're the first to do everything, including the right to climb onto your great-grandmother's best friend when no one else was allowed. It also makes you the apple of her eye, along with that of her mother, her, your grandmother, and your aunt. Others will speak of the many amazing feats of Tom, but I wanted to say a few words on behalf of myself, my dad, and Tom's brother, Terry. He was a good student, attending Florence Brasser Elementary School. He was a Boy Scout, attending Lake Masawipi in the summers. Now Tom is the oldest, and I am the youngest of the Wentz Hashman cousins, separated by 19 years. When Barb asked me to speak about Tom's childhood, I thought he was nearly an adult when I was born. I certainly never knew him as a child. But my father, known to him as Uncle Jack, was 14 years younger than his sister, Tom's mother, Mickey. By coincidence, my dad was 14 when Tom was born. And although my dad, who couldn't be here today, recounted the love they shared, he had a few stories. He said, at seven, at nearly 70 years later, it's hard to remember, but he had a few stories that he likes to share. <clears throat> that Tom and it, that Tom's dad spent long days working hard at Kodak, and my dad spent many hours trying to fill the gap, playing and investing <clears throat> in Tom and his brother from the moment they were born. Being so much younger than his sister, he was overjoyed to spoil Tom with his time. They took several trips to the Adirondacks and the Catskills, visiting with my folks, along with Graham, Wynn, and Mick, to the North Pole and the Enchanted Forest, everyone's favorite, frontier land, where cowboys and Indians got on the train and robbed you for your candy. <laughs> Tom, was the child, Tom as a child was a wide-eyed dreamer with a gentle smile and a spirit, but with a touch of adventure, his squeaky clean image was occasionally tarnished by that of his uncle who loved him so. Like the time Dad convinced him to ride tandem on his new bike, even though he had been told not to, and my dad at the helm and him on the handlebars, promptly crashed, leaving Tom in his car he would carry into adulthood. <laughs> but his brother Terry recalled some other adventures, and I'm going to read from Terry's words, and I'm going to read it in first person, because that's Terry's writing. My memories of our younger years when we lived on Kubla Drive included watching the Mickey Mouse Club, Spin and Marty and the Hardy Boys on TV every night, and the Three Stooges Looney Tune cartoons, and wrestling on Saturdays, along with our childhood pet, Sparky. We also spent a lot of time running and playing in the neighborhood and in the woods behind our house. We also shared the time together at Grandma and Aunt Wynn's place every week, which we always looked forward to, and fishing together on the dock in East Bay near Grandma and Grandpa Hashman's cottage. When we moved to Chestnut Drive, there were football games and baseball games with the Olmsteads, the Batses, the Gottschalks, and riding bikes to Westgate Plaza. Want to remember next, as we became teenagers, is Tom's friendships with Jim Myers, Bill Bella Pianta, and the others that came that became part of our family and remain so to this day. We also shared the love of music. Tom had his folk troop, folk group, I had my rock band, both of which practiced at our house. Specifically, what I recall from all this is Tom always being there to protect me from whatever might come up. There was a time when we were very young that the neighborhood bully was coming at me and Tom took a beating for me. Tom was always there to give me guidance. Most of the time, good solid guidance. But there was, however, the time, I think I was two or three, when Tom convinced me to paint my brand new shoes yellow when we were at Grandma and Grandpa's house and they were repainting the outside. 
I'm not sure I ever really forgave him for that. I, looked for the, I was looking for the proper things to say today, and I came across the following prayer. Dear loving Father, the presence of my brother Tom in my life is a gift to me. Thank you for his life, his heart, and his soul. Thanks for giving me, <clears throat> for giving me someone who looked out for me and cared for me. Thank you for what I learned from my brother's life and love. So now I ask you, Lord, bless my brother with abundance of your love and mercy. Cover him with your grace. Let him feel your tenderness and touch his soul. Let him know your mercy and set his spirit free. Open up the heavens to him and bring him great peace and joy. Thank you for my brother to the Lord. Thank you for his life and his love. Sorry, technology. <clears throat> I had the privilege of being mentored by Tom much the same way my father mentored him. <clears throat> and pass on that same tradition to his children. What a blessing it's been for me to share their home, to share their laughter, to share their, meal, their meals, <clears throat> their faith, and their love. So what's the best news aside from me, the best news aside from me being almost finished? The lottery is done. You won. We all did. If you receive a chance to celebrate Tom's legacy with a stranger sitting next to you who by no chance loved Tom and who Tom loved, now go forth and spread that love. Technology. Thank you, I want to know how you got up being up here. <laughs> nice, nice job. I may not make it. Okay, well, I'm, I'm here to uh, talk about the high school days uh, as much as I can. I talked to my attorney beforehand, so most of the, uh, most of the tales that if you want to talk about them later, guys in Newtown from high school days. Statute of Limitations has passed, so we're good to go. A lot of the things that I'll be talking about uh, here, I, I want you to uh, notice how they really shaped who Tom uh, was and who Tom became in his life. He, he was a real team player. He was, uh, he was with the Base Child Life soccer team his uh, sophomore, junior, and senior year. He was content to uh, let one of our other friends, uh, forward Jimmy Lotta, score all the goals uh, with us knowing that we really were in the backfield winning the game because we stopped all the other goals. <laughs> he was a member of High Wide. Now, I was a member of High Wide, but I actually had to Google High Wide to find out what the heck it was. <laughs> See, you got to remember, Tom, Tom was my Google before there was Google. He, you know, he knew all this stuff. He was, he was my, my GPS uh, before there was satellites uh, beaming stuff down. Highway. Uh, highway clubs are U.S. social clubs for middle school and high school boys and girls that are affiliated with the YMCA. The purpose of the clubs are to create, maintain, and extend throughout the home, school, and community, high standards of Christian character. Tommy was in the chorus for his junior and senior year. He was in the modern airs for his senior year. Those were for the people who really could sing, not for the rest of us who just joined the chorus because, you know, as guys, we knew there were a lot of girls in the chorus. <laughs> 
He also was uh, all county chorus his senior year. And he organized one of the uh, hoop names, they were called, at Gates Chai Lai. Um, he had a professional singing career, which you might not know. It was uh, called the Hoop and Hollers. That was his uh, group, and I know it was a professional singing career because I was in the Hoop and Hollers, and our parents uh, paid a church to let us sing there. <laughs> The, the six of us uh, were able to split, I think, uh, something like $20. So that was the beginning of his professional career. He had a professional acting, well, it wasn't a professional acting career, but he had an acting career as Will Parker in, uh, in Oklahoma when he was a junior. He was on the track team his uh, freshman and sophomore year. He was in intramurals for his entire uh, time at Gates Chile. He was the student council all four years at Gage Child Lake. He was the senior class treasurer. He was on the varsity club. He was in the business club. He was in the Spanish club. He was in the yearbook. He organized that uh, his freshman and sophomore years. So these are the things that uh, you can find uh, if you went to probably one of the yearbooks. Uh, but there are other things in high school that Tom was uh, very proud of. I think one of the things Tom was most proud of was the fact that he was in a fraternity called Phi Beta Delta. Now, in those days, uh, we had fraternities in high school. Most of the uh, high schools in Rochester had the fraternities. He was an officer in uh, Phi Beta Delta. He was president uh, his senior year of Phi Beta Delta. We were a little unusual in that we were a service uh, fraternity also. We, uh, we packed and made baskets for Hillside, Hillside Children's Center. We did fundraising for St. Jude Hospital. And we wrapped presents for the children in hospitals at Christmas time. And Tom was very involved and instrumental in starting many of those things. Now, another thing that uh, we had as the uh, fraternity in high school, we had something called house party. House party is something to this day, I, I just look, and, and we all kind of put our hands up and, and say to ourselves, how the heck did we get away with that? <laughs> what it was was the fraternity, which was a bunch of high school uh, students, boys and girls, uh, went up to Sodas Point, Sodas Bay, and uh, somebody would actually rent their cottage out to us and camp out to us, and we stayed there the whole week. Separately. Oh, yeah, separately, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were up there, Barbara. <laughs> like, like I say, the statute of limitations is bad. <laughs> the sororities did have a house mother. Uh, we did. We did not have a house father, but we had. Uh, we had Tom, and even back then, uh, he, he kind of got the nickname Father Tom uh, because. Uh, he would, don't, don't get me wrong, Tom, uh, Tom liked to have as much fun as the rest of us, but he was, he was the stabilizer of, I think, the rest of us. He, uh, he was always there if we needed a ride. He was there if we needed to talk to somebody. If we uh, felt that we wanted to get a little advice. And that's unusual for a, a high school kid. I want advice. Didn't come to the parents, but we would go to Tom. If you just wanted to listen, uh, if you had some problems, or if you wanted to tell somebody a secret, uh, that was Tom Hashing. And I know that many of you, uh, as you know Tom, those traits apply to Tom right up through his, uh, right up through his adulthood. Well, he did graduate from high school, and he went on to Rogers Wesleyan College, but he never really left high school, because he had to come back to uh, date some young lady named uh, Barbara Pilato back then. And uh, I have one, which by the way, I don't know, I don't know how your parents ever uh, let you do that. I know that, I know that Ed was just thrilled with that, uh, <laughs> that he was, that Tommy was dating you. Um, Amy found something for me, and uh, I, I wanted to read this. It was uh, something that Tom wrote for her. 
It was in a journal. It says, tell me about your wedding day. What happened? What did you feel? Or how did you feel? Or were you nervous? And this is Tom's writing. I couldn't wait. I spent the whole day with Uncle, G with Uncle Jim. He made me breakfast. We played pool and miniature golf. Huh? Wild and crazy guys, huh? <laughs> this, this is a bachelor very dumb. We went, for, we went out for a couple of drinks. We got dressed in our tuxedos and got to the church five minutes before the ceremony. That sounds about right. I, I remember seeing your mom coming down the aisle and having Uncle Jim say to me, Tommy, she's beautiful. And she was. He was absolutely right. I was very, very happy and very blessed. And the other thing that I told him that day, I said, Tommy, don't ever lose her. He never did. We have the privilege of listening to Susan Virtue on her time with a gift of song.
I'd like to welcome a, uh, a great friend to Tom and his family, and a sage to the entire Rochester community, Minister Raymond Scott, to come and share a bit about Tom's work life.
in residence with their moms to avoid the conflict of mothers losing their children to foster care. This was the first model of its kind in New York State. And it was replicated later by a Catholic family center in Newark, New York at Hannah Hall. Tom also was proud of the fact that he helped put together the substance abuse intervention services for the deaf at RIT. And this was the first prevention and referral program for the deaf in New York State. It referred to deaf, it referred deaf individuals to treatment programs and assisted with cultural and accessibility concerns. Tom assisted in the development of the Rochester City Drug Court, the first drug court in New York State with Judge John Swartz. He assisted in the developing of the LIFE program at St. Joseph's Village. This was the first such program treating adolescents for both drug and alcohol addiction in New York State. Tom worked in developing the Robert Anderson Detox Facility on the campus of the Bath VA Hospital in Bath, New York. And to our knowledge, this program that is operated by the Loyola Recovery Foundation is the first established collaboratively program with not for profit with a not for profit county government, state government, and the federal government. Pull them all together. And that was one of Thomas traits. It too has been replicated in Albany, New York, VA. The other thing about Tom is that Tom seemed to know everybody. <laughs> and everybody seemed to know him. Uh, Barb shared that Tom was notorious for knowing people any place he went. Even on that honeymoon, he ran to folks he knew. And they were in Canada. <laughs> on another occasion, someone from Oasis Another office of Oasis in another city was in town and they called Tom to see if they could get together for a beer. Tom couldn't make it that night. He had another commitment. The guy went to a bar and ended up talking to another man who within minutes discovered that he knew Tom Asher. <laughs> And I debated whether to tell you this, this next thing, but I, I hear tell that um, the Pope came to town at one point. And when we went up, we were standing there just looking up at the Pope, and there was another guy up there. <laughs> and a guy that we didn't know just came up and stood beside us and said, Hey, who is that guy standing next to Tom? <laughs> he knew everybody. And was what was, was more popular than most. But seriously. And we shared the good, the bad, and the ugly. It was one of those people that you could just get real with. And like someone has said, you never had to worry about where it went. It stayed right there. Yeah. You couldn't be around Tom long without his, without 
his witness for the Lord rolling off his lips. It, just, it wouldn't happen. His co-worker shared that his faith in the Lord and his love for his family were first in his life. They also shared something that I thought was interesting and I, I think we can all take note of it. They also shared that every March on his daughter Amy's birthday, he would take her for hot chocolate and chocolate chip pancakes at Perkins before taking her to school. That was a ritual that they had, and I thought that was cool. <coughs> Fathers, take note. They love that he had done that. And they love hearing about it. In closing, Barb, When Jesus said, my peace I leave with you, not peace as the world gives, he was talking about peace in the midst of a storm. And you guys have shown us by your faith and action what that looks like. I marveled, and every time I left a message of some kind, I'm carrying it. I was I was amazed at the peace that you guys exemplify, and it was a peace that passes all understanding, because a number of people, I'm sure, wondered how you could do. And we know it was Jesus. We know it was. So you guys have shown us by your faith and action what that looks like, that peace that the Lord talked about. And I want to say thank you. Because I was deeply encouraged. Deeply, deeply encouraged. And I'm praying that that peace will continue to rest, rule, and abide in you and your family. As you all know, Tom loved music, and Tom was a good friend with Bat McGrath. And at one point in Tom's life, Bat wrote a song that was dedicated to Tom Hashman and another friend of his name, Tom, who both had made such an impression on his life because of the way they treated other people. And we have a, that song and the slideshow to go along with it. Just to 
Uh, Tom did not hesitate to go head to head with anyone because he believed in what he was fighting for. Determination, we all know of his tireless advocacy for those who were in need throughout his whole life. Now, a maven, somebody might know that word, is a trusted expert in a particular field or fields. If you grew up in a Jewish family, it's fields because everybody's an expert on everything. <laughs> The word comes from Hebrew, meaning one who understands, and it's based on accumulation of knowledge, and it's especially used in the context of somebody who shares that knowledge with other people. The presenter asked us to write down someone we know who is Maven, and I wrote down Tom Ashton. And I have to share just a little aside. I knew, kind of knew, the guy who was sitting next to me, and we had like a little competition going, on, because for the first two, he wrote down his mother. <laughs> <laughs> so he had shared, his, he shared with me his knowledge of the ins and outs of politics, but he taught me something so much more important. In politics, where it's all about winning and losing, Tom taught me that there was more than winning and losing. Uh, we had some wins together, but just to show that I learned from him, I lost the last couple of elections. I was in. Uh, Tom taught me that it was not about the person my opponent was, it was about the person that I was. And what he was really teaching me about was life. And the last word, in the, my favorite one, is mesh. A mesh is a person of great integrity and honor. He's a decent person, an authentic person, a person who helps you when you need help. A mesh behaves in a proper and dignified way, both externally and internally. The word translates from human or person. But to be a person in this way is something so special. Many a Jewish mother has told their, their children, be a person, be a mensch. The presenter asked us to write down someone we know who is a mensch. And I wrote down Tom Cashman. And the other guy wrote his mother. <laughs> and shortly after attending this training, Karen and I visited with Tom and Barb at their home, and at Karen's urging, I shared this story with them. I'm so glad I got to do that, and thank you for letting me share it with you. Our New Testament reading today will be given by Pastor David Young a close friend of the Ashton family.
figure out in the limitations of our thinking. It doesn't work. You know that? I, I remember one time I was carrying my little grandson around. He was three years old and his grandmother just died. We were over her house and I was outside with him because he, he was asking major questions. He was very verbal. And uh, so I, I, he was a little bit angry. And I, I said, well, your grandmother died and gone to heaven. Don't you want to go to heaven? He said, no. I said, why? It's full of dead people. <laughs> <laughs> I was sort of stunned. Because I'd always heard angels and, you know, unicorns and all that kind of stuff. But it suddenly, I mean, Tom and I talked about, it's a place that we already are in, in this kingdom. All we do is we enlarge our vision of what the world is and how we can see much better. And I think Paul, whether his reputation is good or not, I like him. And he was the most sensitive man I, 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 in the New Testament, except for Jesus. And he's describing things in Ephesians about eh, the other world and the invisible world that we can't see, but that's real reality. You ever had somebody say to you, get real? You have to die to do that. Come on. <laughs> Our brightest minds cannot define God's reality. You can't describe where it came from, and you can't describe all that it looks like, but this is a good shot. A little boy, little kids tend to be very literalistic. And I got into this and I thought, here is this great apostle, just a regular guy, a rabbi. He, he spoke the word clearly. But listen to his words, and I'll play with them a little. I can do that. I can't because I'm a member of Pastor Tim. <laughs> As for you, this is, this is Ephesians chapter 2. As for you, don't you remember how you used to exist? Corpses. Dead in life. Buried in transgressions. Wandering the course of this perverse world. Hmm. You were the offspring of the prince of the power of the air. Oh. He owned you. Just as he still controls those living in disobedience. I'm not talking about the outsiders alone. We're all guilty of falling headlong in the persuasive passions of this world. We have all have had our fill of indulging the flesh and mind, obeying impulses to follow perverse thoughts, motivated by dark powers. Is he getting from me with you yet? <laughs> As a result, our natural inclinations led us to be children of wrath just as the rest of mankind. Well, but God, with immeasurable riches, <clears throat> His love and mercy focused on us, united us in the anointed one, and infused our lives with souls of life. Infuse our lifeless souls with life. Even though we were buried under the mountain of sin, He saved us by His grace. My comment, He didn't have to, but wanted to. Why would you want to? Because He loved us. Why? You can ask Him when you get there. He raised us up with Him. This is, this is an interesting language thing here. He raised us up with Him 
and seated us in the heavenly realms with our beloved Jesus the anointed, the liberating king. That language is, when you became a believer, somehow, in ways we are unable to think about, we really can't put it together, he raised us up with Jesus like he took him out of the grave and seated us with him at the right hand of the Father. Now that's truth in a world we don't begin to see or comprehend, but that's where Tom has to see it right now. He did this. He did this for a reason. So that for all eternity. How long is eternity? Long time. That all of our measures don't fit it, do they? For all eternity, we will stand as a living testimony to the incredible riches of His grace and kindness that He freely gives to us by uniting us with Jesus, or Jesus the Anointed. For it's by God's grace that you have been saved. You said something I talked about that some it's when I would give that to somebody like Google or so and so. And it was like, well, you give it to me. You know, and Tom would say the same thing. And we'd think, you know, God's great is that inescapable passion from a character that is so far outside of our vision. But we get all of it and we'll never understand it until we get there. Most of us, I think a lot of reason not that he wouldn't give it to us about our own personal life, especially some other people. You, know. <coughs> you receive it through faith. That is, you just believe it. And you can have it. Of course, by God's grace that you've been saved, you receive it through faith. It was not our plan or our effort. It's not, it, it is God's gift pure and simple. You didn't earn it. Not one of us did. So you don't go around bragging about you must have done some amazing thing somewhere. That's in the book. Okay? For we are all the products of His hand. Heaven's poetry. Etched on our lives. Created in the anointed Jesus to accomplish the good works God arranged for long ago. How has he did that? And he commuted that vision to most of you. I was looking at Jerry Neal to come forward now and share a few remembrances of Tom's gift of faith.
This, of course, often meant long meetings because there were others on the board who were not shy in stating and holding to their positions. Not me, of course, I always agreed with Tom, <laughs> except when I didn't. <laughs> but those long meetings resulted in thorough evaluations of the issues and the questions facing us. You see, reaching a shallow consensus quickly was never a priority for Tom, but developing a considered and well-articulated decision was, and that was a blessing to our fellowship, as was Tom's leadership, his teaching abilities, and his genuine love of God and the people. It's been touched on here that Tom also had a gift for connecting people, especially within the context of the kingdom of God. He once told me that he viewed himself as a doorman for the kingdom of God, not to keep people out, but to usher them to the door, to open it, and to hold it open as long as necessary. Many of the people in this room are in the kingdom or are using their gifts for the kingdom of God because Tom ushered them to the door, opened it, and held it open. I learned a great deal about God, community, and myself through the years of service with Tom and the decades of friendship. If I tried to relay all that I learned, I'd go way past my time and way past your patience. So instead, I'd like to close my time by describing what I see as Tom's enduring legacy. One of my script, favorite scripture passages at times like these begins in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, where Paul writes how he does not want the Thessalonian believers to worry about those who have died before Jesus' return. Paul assures them that we do not grieve like those who have no hope. Because we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. And over this past week, when I applied this passage to Tom, as I thought about Tom, I've come to the conclusion that our word belief is just too weak a word. To say that Tom believed that Jesus died and rose again is the same saying that you believe that things fall down, not up. Trust me when I say to you, you do not believe that things fall down, not up. You know that things fall down, not up. And you've known that since you were a baby in a high chair, dropping your food and sippy cups and toys over the side to watch them fall down, not up. And then to watch somebody pick them all up, put them back on the tray, so that you could drop them again, just to confirm that things fall down, not up. My friends, you do not believe in this little thing called gravity. You know it, you expect it, and if you think about it, your entire life is based on it. So please hear me when I say to you that from my observation of Tom for more than 30 years, and especially this last year of illness, Tom Hashman did not believe that Jesus died and rose again, and that God will bring with him, with Jesus, those who have fallen asleep. Tom Hashman knew it. And he based his entire life on it. And that, for me, is the legacy of Tom that I will remember and treasure. It was an honor to stand with Tom in church leadership. It was a privilege to be counted as one of his friends. It was a gracious gift of God to witness his faith. Amen. Great job. Hi, everybody. Barb, thank you for the privilege. Listen, we've been here a while. The place is packed and warm. Some of us smell. Why don't we all stand, <laughs> stretch for a second.
It's a privilege to be here. So I want to talk just for a few minutes. Barb asked me to speak about what it was with the depth of Tom Heshman's soul that really made him tick. Look, this place is packed. It's so packed that some of our cars are being towed from the city of the parking lot right now because of the fact that we love Tom. But this guy could cross any boundary and touch any kind of life, right or wrong. You've been hearing it and hearing it and hearing it. I used to joke at the time, you have more friends than Jesus. I just, and I don't get this. So let me tell you what I think is really at the core of this man's soul. So in 1982, I met Tom and Barbara. I'm not going to go on a long time. But we had this chemistry. We just clicked, and he and I became buds. We became brothers. And we worked often in the local church and in church ministries and churches. We worked together in the communities and outreaches and service projects. We worked a lot in politics. We stood uh, with the Republicans for a long time, and then Michael Udison switched over to the Dems, and we stood against Republicans for a long time. <laughs> Here is the deal with Tom, because every time we were anywhere doing anything, I forget who said it, he knew everyone. Everybody loved this guy. Here's what I think why. Well, Tom really understood the deep core truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is this. That an eternal God made the human race in his eternal image. And we are made for eternity. Therefore, this life, folks, is preparation. This earthly life is preparation for the opportunity to live in the next eternal life with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That is the real show. This is an audition. So Tom was obsessed with seeing everybody as an eternal soul who needed to come back or return to the Creator. And he called a bunch of you guys out there rascals. Thank you, Gates Charlie guys. Rascals. And I am tired of praying for you guys. <laughs> right or wrong? Well, you're tired of praying. I'm tired of praying for them. But he saw every human being as a rascal. What he meant by that was they veered away from their Father in heaven. They need to come back because he has eternity for them. And he had an amazing gift. He never judged anybody. I mean, Michael talked about him pulling some fast ones. But Tom was able to accept every human being for who they are. It didn't matter where they came from, what kind of economic stratus, what they drove, what their ideology was. It just didn't matter. You want to know why? Because he looked beyond what you see with your natural eye. And these kids know it. They watch their dad be like this all their lives. And he saw a soul, an eternal soul, desperately in need to return to the Creator to spend eternity with them. And I remember at times we'd be working on a campaign or involved in some town government thing. And um, over at Crown Royal, I would say to Tom, you know, that guy is a real jerk. We should just move on from him. And Tom would say, oh, no, let's give another chance. I would say, Tom, this is like the 20th second chance you've given that guy. Bart was a lot like I was. Like, okay, that's it. <laughs> Thank God he married a fiery Italian. You know? I can relate. But, by the way, she and I have mellowed over the years. I hope her children confirm this. Because the influence of Tom. And here's what Tom would say when I would say, do we really want to meet with that guy again, Tom? I mean, we can't even trust him. And he would say, yeah, but he needs Jesus, maybe this time. And I constantly, constantly, because all of you and I, all we rascals here today, all hundreds of us, he didn't see us for what was on our face or what clothes we wore or where you lived or what you made or what you didn't make. He saw your soul, and he said to every one of us, I want you to have what I have. This life is simply a stepping stone. 
I want you to have eternity with God Almighty, the Creator, and the only bridge is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so for 34 years, I've been praying for people I have never met. It's great to meet you guys. <laughs> And you know what? It's easy to look at someone in the middle of a conflict in life. And somebody that's on the other side of what you think, and you think, what a loser. What a jerk. We've all been there. These conflicts, these crises, these problems, folks, they come and go. Some of us are old enough to remember what we were doing when President Kennedy was assassinated. And that was a crisis. But eventually it went, right? Now it was a painful memory, but it went. Eternity never goes away. So I'm going to share these words from Tom Hashman, a man for eternity, from the Lord Jesus Christ himself, to you. Jesus said this, Whoever believes in me will never, ever die, but will have everlasting life, and will be with me and my Father forever. Therefore, Jesus said, Come to me. You've already heard about the fact that all it takes is faith. If you haven't read that. So Tom wants all of us rascals to embrace this truth because I think he wants to spend eternity with us too. Amen? I pray his words get through you. God bless you. I've been, I've been a pastor a few years and I've learned that when everybody gets up and says what you're going to say, God's got something else you need to tell people. And I do. It was the ending of my talk. I mean, literally everything I have in here, people have already said. But you know, when I was talking to Barb on the phone the other night, I read my email once a day, which is a problem for Barb. <laughs> overlapping messages. But you know, one of the things that sometimes you get from this sort of meeting is that we, we get this super guy, Tom Ashton, and, and, and the truth is, he is. He is a super guy. Some of us might be thinking, man, I wish I could do half of what he's done. But the truth is, when you talk to Tom, if you ever actually spend the time to talk to him, Tom's no different than anybody else in this room. See, because Tom believed in the God who comes. You know, if you look back in the family life of our family, it always starts with our grandmother, but with Tom, it started with God. I heard that already. And then, then came Grandma. And God, from that point on, continued to send people into Tom's life, to intersect his life. You know, sometimes we make decisions because we think we're making them. One of those was Tom delayed his confirmation. But that delay created an intersection with God with a man named Dominic Mancini. An intersection they changed the direction of his life. With questions like, how's it going with Jesus, Tommy? That relationship went on even through his college years. A, a relationship that Tom cherished. And then there was an intersection at this crazy place called Lovin'. I've heard stories of this place. They all should have been arrested. <laughs> but his life intersected with a man named Scott Ross and his wife Nedra. And once again, John, Tom's life changed direction because God sent someone to Tom. And that relationship became a grounding force in both Tom and Barb's life. Another intersection was Ted Sinquist. God sent Ted into Tom's life. And once again, that intersection with whom someone God sent him changed the direction of his life.
We'd li I'd like to share two things I know about Tom's faith. <clears throat> First, Tom's witness for the Lord was more than talk. I've been in business most of my adult life, and I've been teaching my kids from the time they were little. Talk is cheap, and checks are hard to come by. Tom was a doer. Not just a talker. And Tom became the instrument of intersection for God. He stopped worrying about who God is sending him. And he came worried about who was God sending him to. See, that, that's where true faith and true maturity come in the Christian life. When you stop worrying about what God's doing for you and you start worrying about what you're doing. For many years, Tom organized a retreat at Covenant Acres. A, treat from, a retreat for men to be themselves, to be raw, to be naked. In our church, we have, a, we have an expression, turtle up or go naked. At those retreats, men learn to take off their shell and let naked. Talk about real things that were happening in their lives, good, bad, and the ugly, where they supported one another, prayed for one another. The men's retreat is a great example of how Tom put his time and energy into being an active intersection for God. For men who needed guidance. For men who were seeking God but were blind on how to get there. He demonstrated his faith in action. I personally would not be standing here today if it wasn't for that retreat. Because it was at that retreat where men encouraged me to let go of the organized religion I was in and go plant a church to help the least of these. To go against the grain. To step out in faith. To do what no one else wants to do. The second thing I would like to share with you, for those of you who don't know the Lord, and, and sometimes doubt and wonder where God is in all of this, Tom sent me a message one day, asked me if I would officiate this memorial service. He had one request, though. Man. He asked me to read the whole journal on Caring Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll get to you, I suck at stuff like that. I don't send cards, I don't do none of that. I, I'm terrible, I don't, I don't do those things. But I sat down for three and a half hours and I read that whole thing. And now I know why. The faith that Tom Byron had in the Lord is everywhere in that journal. They trusted the Lord no matter the outcome from the beginning. Day in and day out they walked together trusting that the Lord was in it. But more than just their faith was there. The Lord was there. It's another story of how the Lord kept crossing their path. How did the Lord do that? There was this one entry that I read, and I couldn't stop crying after I read it. It's a snowflake entry. It was on December 5th. I remember the date. Last year, it was like when they first started going in. It was a week of six medical visits and a PET scan. And they got into this elevator, and hanging below the button of the elevators was this handmade snowflake. 
And on the back was Psalm 94, 19. When worries threaten to overwhelm me, your consolation brings me joy. And then another entry, I call it, You're Beautiful. It was the name of it, but that's what I call it. It was after a very long day, very tiring, when God intersected Barb while she was leaving the hospital alone. As she exited, this woman sitting in a wheelchair looked at her and said, Boy, are you beautiful. And Barb, being Barb, tried to deflect her. Oh, I once was beautiful when I was younger. She would have none of it. She says, no, you are beautiful. An uplifting moment at the end of a long day. It Barb's so Tom knew that Jesus never promised him, or any of us for that matter, a life free from difficulty. But he did promise always to be there with us through it all. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He showed up over and over and over for both Bob and Tom and his family through this journey. Sometimes it was through the still small voice that was inside them. Sometimes it was a handmade snowflake on the wall. Sometimes it was a timely uplifting comment from a complete stranger. Sometimes it was a day sharing the gospel with the nurses. Because we have a God who is ever faithful, who never abandons us. He is the God who seeks us. He seeks every single one of you. I want you to go home tonight and think about your life. Tom Ashton did not enter your life because he's a nice guy, I hate to tell you. He entered your life because he was an intersection and an instrument of the God that I love. My prayer as I, lead, as I end every talk that I give in my church is I always have the ask. It's the question. And my question for you is, do you know Jesus as well as my cousin Tom does? Not did, does. Tom's not did. Tom it is. Tom knows Jesus so intimately today, it would blow your mind. Because I have no doubt. In my mind, that when the angels took Tom, he heard, well done, good and faithful servant.
When he asked me out on a date, I didn't know it was a date. I thought it was this old guy offering to give me and my friends a ride to a Bible study. <laughs> so I invited some other people. And, um, so he took us and went to this other prayer session and thing, Christian thing. And he took everybody home and then he said, okay, now, that was supposed to be a date. What are you doing tomorrow and don't invite anybody else? <laughs> so, um, what I liked about him was that he was genuinely seeking God and not super religious or fake, fakely pious. Um, and the thing that really got me, we were downtown one day when we used to be a Rochester downtown, and there was a blind man selling pencils. And um, I walked by, the town went up, and he came over to me. And he just took the man's hand in both of his hands and grabbed it. And the man had some cards about Christ. And Tom said, oh, I'm a believer too. I go to Roberts Wells in college. And he just really engaged the man in conversation. And so that, that got me. I loved that. Okay, so um, we grew up together. Uh, we got engaged on my 18th birthday. I met him when I was 17 which is a good thing. We got married young so that I got to have 45 years with him. Um, we've been members of different churches, but always part of the body of Christ around the world. Um, we had a daughter who was stillborn after I had a car accident and my, I was seven months pregnant. And about a year after that, we almost lost our marriage. We both drifted the Lord carried us through that, but then we kind of both drifted away from each other and away from the Lord, but he didn't let us go. And he kept us from going off the edge of the cliff. So I just wanted to make it clear that in that and in this illness, we are just humans with clay feet. And I wanted to encourage young people and young lovers that when you can't communicate and you talk and talk and your partner doesn't understand what you're saying, as you both get closer to God, you're getting closer to one another too. And there were times when we would pray and say, Lord, we don't get it. We don't understand what the other one's talking about or feeling. Please help us. Um, he would send me flowers a lot, but at least four times a year. Valentine's Day, um, our anniversary, my birthday, and then November 19th, 34 years ago, was the day we didn't get a divorce. And um, he never forgot that date. Um, he, this past year, when he was so sick, he had one of our kids get the kettle lilies they were. And I don't know if you know how um, um, fragile, thank you, uh, kettle lilies are. But he sent them on November 19th. On December 19th, 10 out of the 12 were still alive. That's really long for Calabillies. Then by um, Christmas, um, two were still alive. And so we joked that that was the two of us. And we're so thankful we got Christmas with our kids. That was one thing we prayed for. Um, on December 30th, one of them was starting to brown. And then when I came back from the hospital after he died on December 31st, they were both brown. And that, that's like, would make a good scene in the movie. <laughs> um, um, I'm very thankful that we didn't wait and to take our big anniversary trip till 50 years. We got to go to Scotland for our 25th, thanks to the deaf community. And I'd also like to thank the deaf community for everything I've learned over the past 38 years um, associating with you. I thank you for what I learned to help my sister get her wish of dying at home when she had ALS, and for what I learned from watching you advocate for yourselves and your children, and the things that worked and the things that don't work. And I just thank you for all of I thank you to my Italian family. Both Tom and I were blessed to come from very generous, hospitable families, and Tom and I always had
did. Well, from time to time, get people living with us. And um, a little bit of sign language you picked up from international deaf people made me look like a really bad interpreter when I tried to voice for him in the hospital right after his ear back to me. Because he would confuse G and H and P and K. And, but uh, it, it, it was, Amy could understand him because she doesn't know real sign. <laughs> um, when he got really sick, um, there was a song, Do I Trust You, that came to him. And the songs from the old loving days, from Phil Keggy and Ted Sandquist, were the songs that really encouraged us. He missed singing so much. He was in a group called the Hooten Hollers in high school, and his first girlfriend sent some beautiful flowers back there. She was in that group, too, and some people were here. Um, when he went in right, for his big surgery, I don't want to go through the whole thing, it's on Caring Bridge, but he left his Bible open with a first circle for me. And um, it wasn't, I just want people to know we are not strong at all. Christ is strong. I want to thank all the people over the past year and the past week who have so, shown us so much love, um, members of various churches we've been part of. The medical community, Wilmot, is an amazing place. They try to make it easy on the families by putting everything together. I cannot tell you the people who have loved us over the past year. I don't remember if I mentioned we got to go to Italy on our 40th, too. Um, our granddaughters left us dozens of notes on that last night before I came home. I just want to thank the Lord for carrying us through every crisis, through um, our whole life, and especially for this. It's, it's been a wonderful life.
of that ugliness and of the messiness. And if someone's going to finally trust you enough to share that heavy burden, that darkness they're carrying, the thing that's been keeping them in bondage so long, and they finally get the courage and they say it to you, and you go, oh my gosh, you did that? You ruined it. You ruined the opportunity that you had to set these people free or to lead them to the one that can set them free. A lot of people told dad a lot of crazy stuff that they were messed up in. And they did that because they knew he was trustworthy. They knew he was not going to recoil. They knew he was not going to mock them or share their secrets with other people, but that he would lead them to the truth. He would hold that door open, as someone said earlier. He would lead them to the truth. Um, for years, my, parent, my parents prayed that God would bring me a man I could not steamroll. <laughs> I tend to be pretty bold. And, um, then I finally went to Korea and met this uh, sexy Puerto Rican guy. And um, he's the first and only boy man that I brought home that my father ever even hinted at giving approval to. He was kind to the others and said, oh, nice guy, whatever. And he was, and, but when I pushed him, I'd say, but Dan, what do you think? He'd say, I just don't think he's the one. I just don't think he's the one. And then it came Mike. And, and after we got married, I had to ask them if I could be let in again because the two were such good friends that I was like, can I please see my dad sometime? You know, whatever. So, um, but I also got to walk down this aisle with my father. And he handed me off to the man of dreams. And I wouldn't even know to search for this man if I didn't have the example of the father that I did and know what kind of man to look for. What a privilege that is. What a privilege that is. Most mornings in my life, I came downstairs to see my dad drinking coffee and reading his Bible, spending time with Jesus. Um... I don't think there's, I don't think there's an age that you ever reach where you don't need your parents. I don't care how grown you are. I don't care how many things you've gone through in life. And two years ago, at 40 years old, Mike and I found ourselves in the middle of unimaginable horror and tragedy. And I called my parents from Puerto Rico and I said, I need you. And mom was sick and couldn't travel and still let her husband go to not stay and take care of her, but to come and take care of me. And within hours, my father was on a plane and he was in Puerto Rico praying for us, interceding for us, taking care of us, being present with us, fathering both of us. That was huge. Dad did not think he arrived. He didn't think he had like the corner on theology. Um, when I was studying at Wyland in England, I called him once and said, Dad, you know, I feel like the Lord's teaching me these things and he's calling me into these different areas of ministry, but I, I kind of think it doesn't line up with your theology. Like, I don't know what you think about women in ministry, and I don't, I'm trying to figure this out. And his response was, you just go after Jesus. I know you know his voice. You just go after him, and you give me room to figure out what I still need to figure out. He didn't give me the impression that he had this corner on truth and I better line up into something. He just kept pushing us to go after the Lord. Dad had said um, his role that he wanted was not to be Jesus to anybody, but more of like a John the Baptist. His goal was to say, there's Jesus. Go after him. There's Jesus. There he is. There's your Messiah. There's your Savior. You just go after him. I just want you to fall in love with Jesus and then you and he can work it out. It doesn't have to look like my relationship with the Lord. The words don't have to be like the way I explain them. You just go after Jesus, and then the two of you can have your own romance. If you want, if you miss my dad, if you want to see the depth and the, the arts and the passion and um, the creativity, just look at my brothers. They're incredible men who have all of Tom's passions and his music and his giftings and his creativity, the way they take care of their wives and their children, the way they take care of their friends, Tom is all over these three men that I have the privilege of being a sister to. And that's it.
Love my dad. I love you all for being here. First of all, thank you all for coming. Thank you all that spoke, and, and uh, I really appreciate it. And, uh, <laughs> I was trying for a while to think about what to say when I got there, and just like Jeff was saying, a lot of things that I was going to say, other people said, but um, <laughs> I did want to share that I think about how to make that because <laughs> um, my dad believes he heard from God. I've always asked him about that. We need to hear from God. They look, they look that way. Um, and uh, when I was trying to think about what to say, I was in the car, and I was like, you know, just kind of praying. Um, but in the way that that looks like for me, it was, might kind of be weird and shocked for some of you, but... Um, <laughs> and uh, I was like, what should I talk about? I turned on car radio and uh, you know the band Heart from the 80s? <laughs> it comes out like, what about love? <laughs> and, uh, and, um, sorry. <laughs> um, so, my theology isn't exactly like my dad's, but, um, but I'm glad for, um, the parts that are, and I'm, and I'm, I'm glad for, and pointing me towards Jesus. I do believe in Jesus. And I um, I believe in love and I believe that love does win in the end. I believe that the God that created all this is able to welcome us all in. And I I look forward to seeing all of you up there with him. So thank you for all for coming.
closing hymn, sing with all the saints in glory, Tom and Barb, and the family. We'd like to give a thanks to all the men who performed who are listed in the handouts of Mother Tom's poem on the video table in the social hall downstairs. Afterwards, please make your way to the rear of the sanctuary where you'll be directed downstairs into the social hall for reception and refreshments and greeting the family downstairs. When you enter the social hall, there will be a corner for you to video any message that you would love to send to Tom's family for you to have that opportunity to do so and also sign the guest book. Thank you for honoring Tom here today. Let us all rise as we close in prayer and close in him. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the life that you gave Tom through your son, through his death and resurrection. We ask, Lord, that Tom's inspiring life would inspire us to be men and women of God for the kingdom. And so as we close here, Lord, we are grateful that we have an intersection with Tom Hashman and, in, and his Savior. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.